So existentialism is basically a form of philosophical inquiry, which is interested in human existence as such. And you know, in its concreteness, and what is the most uh, interesting for me, that it includes its negative sides, or maybe even tragic sides of human existence and uh, problematic nature. Uh, existentialism started from 1930, although we're going to uh, discuss a little bit Kierkegaard, who was before that time, who was a forerunner of existentialism and was mostly developed to mid 20th century. Uh, me, I am, I could be called practicing existential uh, psychoanalyst. So this is what I practice, it still exists. People still work in this, uh, in this field. Uh, existentialism appeared basically uh, after the, uh, during the secularization of, of society and of thinking. So when people started to be deprived of God, deprived of uh, any directions, uh, traditional directions of which were religious ones of uh, their behavior, their thinking, their understanding of the world. So they found themselves uh, lost within their existence. And they started to pay uh, att more attention to concrete existence of uh, an individual in all its uh, tragicality, tragedy, in all its negative aspects and its problematic nature. Basically, this is philosophy of a uh, human deprived of God and all the framework that religion uh, provides. What is the sense of our life? Uh, how do we have to behave in our lives? If you take away this and all you are left is the existence of, of and its problematic nature. Uh, first one, the forerunner of existentialism is Kierkegaard. Uh, he is still religious uh, author, but um, he represents the switch to the existential, existential thinking. And he was the one uh, who started to discuss anxiety as the human condition, anxiety, what is translated as anxiety, but basically it's angst. Uh, uh, for him, angst is the human core and freedom actu actuality. But so he uh, admits that human existence is anxious that our existentiality uh, causes us this feeling of um, anxiety because we are lost, we don't know the answers. We uh, uh, we completely lost in, uh, in our existence. But for him, he kind of uh, advocates the leap of faith. Uh, so for him, we still need to uh, jump out of this existential anxiety into a faith. And maybe he is correct because it's really hard to exist within the uh, existential anxiety. And this is what makes him a religious author. But he, he was the first one to recognize that the human core is anxiety, uh, this angst. It's the, uh, like a basic mood, the way Heidegger will put it uh, later. Uh, and this is like the fate or for human to feel it. We, and for him, it's also the, the basis of our freedom when we start to question uh, some answers that we already have. Why do we exist? Uh, who are we? Why are we here? And this causes anxiety because we can never, we never know answers for, for, sure, for sure. We never have the certainty. Uh, so he claimed that anxiety is a pivot I, upon which everything turns. So it's existentialism is uh, weird, and I like it for this, that at the center is all those negative uh, sides of existence. Unlike in, in psychology, that would be the opposite. Um, and one of my favorite words is whoever learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the uh, yeah, whoever has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. So basically, if we are thrown into the uh, into the existence and this makes us anxious, we don't have 
we'll never find the final answer uh, of meaning of our life, of who we are. Um, and this causes anxiety and we are stuck with this anxiety. The only thing you can do, the only thing you can kind of manipulate is this uh, anxiety as such. So this will be useful for to understand for, for later. So today. <laughs> so Heidegger is the one who is normally associated with existentialism, although Heidegger himself didn't agree that he was existentialist. Um, Sartre was the one who would uh, call himself existentialist and would claim that Heidegger as his forerunner was existentialist too. Uh, so now because of Sartre's um, influence, we perceive Heidegger as existentialist, even if Heidegger wouldn't agree with us. Uh, his main uh, work is Being in Time, published in 1927. Uh, where he discusses being and he discusses time. So when I say, for example, uh, I am a student or I am a professor, we tend to, uh, we have this weird part in the centers, I am, am, uh, which mentions that my existence, right? And when we talk in the language, we always have this part, just we don't pay attention to it. Uh, to the very fact of existence, my existence as professor or my personal existence. We tend to be distracted from this layer of, uh, of existence. And, and Heidegger was the first one who precisely paid attention to this and discussed this very fact of existence, the very existentiality of a human. And uh, this was a switch to secular part of the switch to secular thinking. Uh, so what he discusses is Dasein. Dasein is human being in the world, it's human existence. Uh, he's discussing how uh, its specificity. Uh, he's discussing thrownness. So the idea that humans are thrown into the world, are left alone in the world. They don't know, uh, we don't know why we are here. And we have this feeling of thrownness that we are uh, left alone. And as a result, we have angst as the basic, basic mood, angst, anxiety as the uh, basic mood, the Grundstimmung, uh, that is always there, that is always a part of our human existence. And on this basis, Heidegger would distinguish different modes of existence. Uh, so he kind of valued anxiety and he claimed that uh, in, there is inauthentic uh, existence and authentic existence. Inauthentic existence is when you try to silence uh, the voice of anxiety, when you're completely immersed into the ways of the, of the world, when you uh, don't try to uh, question uh, the answer is that you already have what your life is uh, for. What is the sense of your life? What do you have to do in your life? When you like follow authorities of the world, parents, university, <laughs> professors, um, you don't have this helps you to, uh, to calm down your, your existential anxiety. But you, because of this, you live as this is existence of das man, just they, the people. As such, it's not individualized for Heidegger. Um, and it's not authentic. Authentic uh, existence presupposes uh, it is individualized. Design is more free uh, design. And it presupposes that you listen to the voice of anxiety, that you don't escape uh, into, the, uh, into the already given existing answers and solutions. Uh, but you hanging a little bit in the uncertainty of your existence in the state where you don't have answers, you don't rely on someone's answers. Uh, and this what for Heidegger is the basis of uh, subject's independence and uh, freedom. Now the quote, original anxiety in existence 
is usually repressed, but anxiety, this angst is there. It's always there. It's only sleeping. So whatever is happening in our lives, like normal, uh, you live normal lives doing normal stuff, but anytime uh, we might fall uh, into this position where we are forced to question it. Uh, that those ways of the that other people, for example, that university knows the answer, what you need to study, or that uh, ways of existence that your parents suggested you are completely, uh, that they knew what they recommended you, or uh, someone betrayed you and your picture of the world is ruined because you didn't expect that this person will do it and you, uh, you plunk in, into this uncertainty, your this world you feel this thrownness. The world is foreign to you, and so anxiety is. There is always chance that this will happen. That you'll come back. That you'll fall out into this uh, into this basic mood. It's always there potentially, not potentially, but actually. And but world is organized in such a way that we have mechanisms how to escape it. <clears throat> All that. Um, our greatest reality, it's Amy Van Dorsen, it's contemporary uh, uh, existential psychotherapist. Uh, she claims that as an example of some, someone who today develops this existential therapy and existential philosophy, uh, she claims that our greatest reality lies in anxiety that reminds us that we are not basically at home safe or substantial and that calls us to attention to action and to awareness of being. Uh, this is position of contemporary, uh, you might say existential uh, theory of existential therapy. Uh, and also what lacks uh, a little bit and we'll discuss this aspect more during my other weeks is in existentialism. Uh, it's in my view, it's overly emphasizes individuality like uh, angst is the feeling of individual and uh, it doesn't include except for martin bober existentialist doesn't include that much the very connectivity of people and angst or anxiety as the uh, as a quality of not only of individual but also of people connecting to each other it's just important to remember but there is this uh, chris Molson who talks uh, precisely about this, that this being, it's not being individualized being, it's being, it's always being with others. Uh, it's mostly useful for, to remember for next weeks, uh, we'll, we'll try to switch this perspective of individualized anxiety to common anxiety. Um, my favorite philosopher who, uh, explains all the existentialism. He's not really well known, but he uh, kind of summarizes well in his quite simple ideas, the whole um, perspective of uh, psychoanalysis, of uh, existential philosophy. And uh, um, yeah, and he also connects it. He directly criticizes uh, conventional psychology on the basis of these ideas. Uh, for him, and he um, based his thinking on evolutionary theory back at the time. His most, most famous essay is The Last Messiah, it's quite short. And his main statement, main idea is probably that existential anxiety or just anxiety is the constitutive for human uh, consciousness because human consciousness is overdeveloped. So, uh, we are kind of too smart when there is nothing we and for him we are the mistake of the nature and there is nothing we can do to get rid of our suffering because we tend to uh, we tend to reflect overly reflect and we also tend to search for because of our overly developed intellect we, let, we tend to search for the meaning of everything uh, but it's impossible for us to to find it and yeah, so he claims that human consciousness is a biological paradox and uh, of animation, absurdity, exaggeration, or disastrous nature. 
uh, and it's quite progressive perception of evolution because uh, more uh, Darwinistic evolution initially it suggested that there is this progress uh, and you know the newer species are more pro progressive species and as evolution goes it progress it, it's a progress somewhere uh, species are um, more adapted more developed uh, better but it's not true uh, evolution doesn't work in in, in such a way uh, at least exactly uh, because species do extinct uh, and species are quite weird you can't say that they are better or more adapted or more complex it's evolution is a different process so it is reasonable to claim uh, to call human not as a semblance of god the best of, of all animals and the most developed it's just weird it's a mistake in its own weird way um, and therefore he uh, he considered uh, human activity relying on this idea that we are a mistake we are paradox that we are uh, doomed to suffer all our lives uh, he claimed that whatever we do, all human activity is basically an attempt to escape this, uh, this suffering that we are not uh, able to, to escape because this is our nature, uh, which is our nature and this nature is a mistake. So this, those are some of the defense mechanisms that we do to, and this was, constitutes our lives. So there is suffering, uh, existential suffering, anxiety, it's inevitable. Therefore, because it's our nature, because our nature is a mistake, so all we do, we try to forget about it or escape from it. Of course, we always fail, fail, but this failure, it was constitute everything, like human culture. Uh, for example, one of the defense mechanisms is uh, repression of disturbing and uh, destructive thoughts and feelings. When we repress, when we try not to think about them, uh, anchoring when we uh, when we try to establish higher meanings and ideals and we believe in them it's Kierkegaard's leap of faith we have God we have those higher uh, state morality uh, law of life people future we state that this this life has a meaning this is our meaning and we try not to not to reflect on it it is really does it worth it uh, to to live or to um to act in the name of, of this the university might be one of the anchoring mechanism like you have a uh, you have certain structure that promises that it will form you in a way it's good for you or it will provide you answers or it will at least question you uh teach you how to question properly so Safka probably would see university same as church as this anchoring mechanism that try to escape mechanism from the recognition of the meaninglessness of our suffering and uh, pointlessness of our existence. Sublimation is the one that Tap claimed he does. It's not Freudian sublimation, it's just sublimation of not of sexual drive like in Freud, but simply of the initial suffering. When you do recognize it, you, you're not able to run away from it you understand the meaninglessness and you don't believe anymore you're cynical enough uh, to believe not to believe into the higher ideals for example the only thing left to do is for to work with this recognition as such you can write about it you can do literature and art you can draw it that's also uh interesting variant of existence but it won't help at the end uh anyway Sapka is very interested in his um, in his view and his criticism of psychiatry and psychology, because in psychology and our society is a uh, therapeutic society. Basically, we all the perspective framework in which we think about ourselves is psychological. Our self relationships uh, it's kind of current uh, current trend to think in psychological terms. And psychology is quite positively oriented. So it suggests that you have this health uh, without suffering. 
within you somewhere and you need to reach this health. You need to get rid of the suffer, mental suffering. So mental suffering it perceives as something foreign. Um, and it's also for Tzapfa, it would be a way of uh, escaping uh, inevitable suffering. And he suggests that maybe on the contrary, those uh, ex the existential suffering like depression we can count and anxiety, those can be actually a voice of our, of who we are, a sick, uh, creatures who are doomed <laughs> to suffer and uh, on the contrary the happiness would be basically the escape and I draw this very proud of it <clears throat> I, although it looks a bit inappropriate I draw it for trauma course uh, so it's easy to see the difference between uh, pop psychology rather and our therapeutic mind uh, the way we think, we tend to think, and between philosophy, perspective of philosophy, especially existential philosophy. So for psychology, at the core would be health. There is this uh, idea of uh, that there are normal people who don't suffer, and we need, to, and this is normality, or we need to dig into ourselves to, to discover the state of health, where there is harmony, where we are happy. And we do believe, and it's nice to believe that everyone has this, this state of normality. And when we suffer, we just sick. And it's a deviation. It's something foreign to us. It doesn't belong to us. And there, is a lot, there are lives, and our life could be like that, that we, shouldn't, we won't feel anxiety, we won't feel suffering, because it's not normal for humans to do that. In, in philosophy, starting from Kierkegaard, not only from Kierkegaard, but from Greek philosophy already, uh, especially in existential philosophy, at the, at the core, just switch perspective. At the core is anxiety. And all we do, what we call health, the uh, condition of living that we can, where we can survive, which is livable for us, uh, is basically escape from this anxiety. But anxiety is always there. Suffering potentially is always there, You're just uh, sleeping. So that's the, that's the difference. And what I'm trying to do uh, with the perspective of learning, I'm trying to see, to implement this uh, philosophical perspective, to see ex uh, existential dimension of learning, uh, as opposed to the perspective of psychology, which we normally uh, tend to uh, associate when we tend to, the one that we tend to employ when we think about education. And the person who already did it uh, was doing, still doing it, is Ronald Barnett. Uh, he is a professor at the Institute of Education at the University of London. And the, the book, uh, A Will to Learn Being a Student in an Age of Uncertainty, is the one that you can read some part of it, at least for the seminar for this week. So what he does, he takes uh, existential, phenomenological and existentialist perspective and tries to see uh, education, learning, and being students through this uh, perspective, precisely Heidegger's uh, perspective. You'll find out more once you'll read this book or during the seminar. And he mentions this ritual. He starts his book with a different picture, but he mentions ritual of Nagol, Nagol uh, in Africa, where to become a man, uh, one has to go through the ritual of, it's called land diving. So he, he um, compares uh, beginning uh, to study at the university with a man who's supposed to be initiated standing, uh, on the platform before they jumped into uncertainty, into potentially something dangerous and unknown. Uh, it's, it requires that you feel yourself <laughs> like that. It requires uh, to be you know, brave. Uh, and this is the feeling that it not only, of course, of a student, um, but also feeling of. Uh, existence and starting everything, anything new, a new kind of uh, new type of existence, becoming a new type of being. So this is become this is how he <clears throat> the metaphor that he uh, uses for becoming a student. 
And of course, being a student for him is, although uh, in the same way as for Heidegger in a similar way, being a student is to be in a state of anxiety. It's in inevitable. Existential, not only existential anxiety, but especially today when we live in a secular age of uncertainty. Uh, we don't trust anyone to, to have a final answer. We don't trust religious authorities, which was comforting before. Um, and university was basically part of religious uh, education um, because it initially appeared as a religious uh, institution to transfer religious knowledge to give answer to questions. Uh, so quite comforting, unlike now, when we don't trust our professors, when we don't trust uh, people to have final answers. And when we live in an age of uncertainty, it's not only existential, well, it is existential anxiety, but it's very, anxiety is more real for us. And if you remember uh, Heidegger distinction on inauthentic and authentic way of, ways of life, and authentic ones suggested that we need to tolerate at least to some extent anxiety, of uncertainty, not to be immersed fully into the ways of the world, uh, to be involved into thinking, independent thinking, uh, to doubt uh, ready uh, answers, already given answers. This all suggests that, uh, well, this is all what now, what university wants from students, right? To develop this uncertainty, critical thinking, to be, uh, to start to exist authentically. Therefore, it suggests uh, more anxiety than uh, not being a student, especially now where university doesn't provide final answers when they teach you to be constantly critical of yourself according to recent SAS values, not of others, but of yourself <laughs> for some reason, uh, which is extremely anxious. So once you get an answer, once you get knowledge, the value of a university is to further doubt it uh, and to so you, you can never find the certainty to the end and you you know you, contemporary university uh, world changes so fast you don't know what you have to learn you don't know what you have to teach you know you can't there is no way to prepare uh, for uncertainty of the world and uh, keeping you distracted all day by different schedules, by different lectures and seminars and readings. It's just a way to, uh, to distract you from <laughs> this unknowing because no one actually knows. And uh, yeah, the other thing that I wanted to discuss like a second part of the lecture is precisely those concrete negative sides, tragic sides of learning not abstract uh, such as existential anxiety. So this was like more mm, of a general framework with negative you know, in, at the basis, unlike we normally think that there is something positive at the basis. And just to show concrete negative aspects of our existence as, as students, for your existence as students, as, uh, as basic and inevitable. So we'll start with the quote that I don't like. So this, uh, said emoji means that I don't agree with you just in case not to confuse. Mm, so Alistair Smith is quite well known uh, contemporary educator uh, from the UK and his position which represents basically the common position of how we think about such uh, mm, if you're taking pictures don't forget to take picture of said emoji. Uh, he represents how we commonly normally think about such uh, phenomena as stress, as anxiety, and as uh, self-doubt. So they are perceived as enemy. We want to ideally, within our therapeutic society, within our therapeutic education, we want to get rid completely from stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem. So we want to boost uh, self-esteem. We want to get rid of stress and get rid of anxiety. And then we think that this can be a perfect condition for learning. Unfortunately, uh, one might claim, me, <laughs> I might claim that it's not uh, from existential perspective, in the existentialist perspective. It's completely the opposite. Uh, so if you start, yeah, this is the already Greek wisdom to learn is to suffer, math and path, and to suffer is to learn, but to suffer is to learn is more questionable. But 
learning is suffering that was a ancient Greek uh, recognized. And this basically, mm, basically the perspective of the contemporary neuroscience, or at least some part of it. <clears throat> yeah, I need to connect my computer or Sikara will be switched off. Do you agree? Yes. Great. You do. <laughs> Good. So, to learn is to suffer. And this is not, this is where ancient Greek coincide with some of the research in contemporary uh, neuroscience. So stress, so I will talk about stress, self-esteem, we talked about anxiety, and maybe if we have time about the plasticity of the brain, because it's also seen as a positive phenomenon. So stress, initially, the way Celia, Hans Celia, the father of the concept of stress, um, the way he uh, introduced it and what he meant is that stress is a a uh, non-specific response, adaptational response of a body to any demand. And this means that, according to his initial definition, that uh, throughout our lives, we do have at least some amount of stress because stress is life. Even when we sleep, uh, if we are not dead, we have a certain amount of life, a certain amount of stress because it uh, just it means that we are not dead yet. So stress is uh, is adaptational response. Uh, if, if there is adaptational means if there is new situation, we need to adapt to our body. We respond with the stress. We we uh, switch on the adaptational uh, response. We try to pay pay more attention to this situation. This situation bothers us, and there is some activity. Uh, that uh, supposed to be adaptational, and this is stress. So obviously, uh, learning is stressful because uh, we learning we are learning something new. This we exposing ourselves to a certain new information, and we need to adapt to it because it's new. It's uh, it's not about good. Uh, something good is happening, or something bad is happening, because we normally think of stress as uh, adaptation to something bad. But uh, something good, something new might be also good. And you still need to, like being a student, it's very good, <laughs> right? To some, in, in some way. But uh, we still need to adapt to this existence as a student, to the situation of uh, waking up at a certain, uh, certain time, to do a certain amount of work, to learn a certain amount of, it's good, but it's stressful because it's, it requires adaptation. And um, so stress and learning, the way they are connected, uh, we normally react on stress with a uh, whole our body, but some of the manifestation of stress that uh, are connected with learning is anxiety, increased attention and focus and activation of memory. Because when we feel anxious about something, we tend to pay attention to it. We try to solve this problem. Therefore, our attention is increased. We try to memorize, we try to understand, we are focusing it, it bothers us. And this is how we activate our memory and we uh, remember something. This is, for example, one of the principles how post-traumatic stress disorder works, PTSD. Uh, when we have uh, memories of something, some traumatic events and we can't get rid of. It's precisely the same, similar, uh, mechanism when we was something was so anxious, so traumatic that we now can't get rid of a memory of it. It keeps uh, occurring again uh, and again. So this is exaggerated uh, form of memorizing as such. We wouldn't memorize something uh, well if it's not important to us, right? If it's not new, if it's just, uh, if you don't need to, uh, if you are not focusing on it. So this is how stress and learning are connected. And basically, contemporary neuroscience tend to think in this Vogel uh, paper, they claim that uh, 
over the past two decades, uh, research identifies stress and hormones and neurotransmitters of stress as major modulators of uh, human learning. So stress might be seen as a very material, the very process of learning. Of course, we might it's questionable if we can talk about too much stress. We can talk, uh, but it's not questionable that we can talk about um, stress. Uh, yes, yeah, some some stress that it's not, or some situation that students are uh, exposed to that they shouldn't be exposed to, right? But stress is stress is normally useful. It helps you to adapt to this situation. The other idea is if if you, the question rather is if you have to adapt to a certain knowledge, to a certain information. It's not that stress is bad, it's what you feel stress about is questionable. And the other research is useful. Yeah, this, <clears throat> that main modulators of learning are neurotransmitters, sex uh, stress related uh, neurotransmitters and uh, hormones. So the other research that is uh, helpful is uh, Jules uh, and her colleagues. They claim that stress is, uh, it's important to understand that, understand that stress is context uh, related and uh, time related. So to remember something uh, for stress to work as uh, something that helps to learn, it has to be context related. For example, if you are um, preparing for math uh, test and you feel stress uh, or you were feeling stressed about this preparation and you it uh, stress helped you to focus on this preparation, but you start to have a fight with your relatives and you start to be stressed out because of your relatives, it won't help you. This stress, you're stressed, but this kind of stress is not context related, it won't help you to prepare for exam. Uh, you will rather remember better what your, uh, rel what your relatives told you, right? And it, it would be learning too, because you learn how to talk to your, you pay attention, you stress about your relatives, you pay attention to them, you memorize what they told you because you're trying to adapt and fighting with someone is stressful and is uh, trying to adapt. You try to solve the problem, even if you're trying to solve it by killing the other person, right? Um, but it won't help. This kind of stress is not context uh, related. It won't help you to prepare for for exam. What will help you to prepare is when you why we have deadlines because it helps us to uh, you know that well. It helps us both faculty and students <laughs> because it helps us to have the stress that helps us to concentrate and to finish something. Um, it could be too much though, but ideal. Uh, context is not uh, that much a deadline uh, because you will mostly uh, this would be mostly for you the uh, the matter of a test passing a test which is good right you might memorize something but ideally stress context relations related stress to education is when you're inspired so when you read Nietzsche and this bothers you when you read Nietzsche and Nietzsche is so wrong or so right that you feel stress about. This is when you start to actually think, when you start to memorize, not the deadline to submit essay about Nietzsche, but Nietzsche himself. This is would be perfect uh, stress, but not Nietzsche doesn't work because all the all the people, unfortunately. So this is the quote that just shows of uh, how stress is uh, part of the life. It's like breathing. If you, uh, it shows where heart is, what you are inspired, what is your passion, what inspires you, and uh, it's like just like heart beats, and there are some waves uh, in the brain. It's the just the rhythm of our life when we have the stimulation, adaptation, and some um, some time to rest when we have less less stress, but. Stress basically it's what we are, it constitutes life. You can't completely get rid of it, especially in university. Um, 
it might be more useful. It might be more content related, not to deadlines, not to formalities, but to very uh, is something that inspires you and context uh, itself. But that's the only choice. Uh, or you might be inspired enough to transform uh, society and make it more just, right? Or say yes, more, more just or something. That's um, also stress. <clears throat> so the choice is the context of a stress. Stress is you will feel stress, just try to make, to <laughs> use it the right way. Um, uh, other thing, that we can discuss is uh, self-esteem. So it was believed, and it's still a very popular idea within positive psychology and popular psychology that to be um, to be successful, something uh, including to be successful in learning, to be a good student, you need to have a high self-esteem. Uh, you need to love yourself. You need to believe in yourself, and then uh, others will love you. It's not true. <laughs> Others will love you and you'll be successful. And there is plenty of, it's all started with uh, ego psychology. This idea that you need to first believe in yourself and then everything else will follow. Uh, it's not true. And including about the, the you have to love yourself and others will love you. There was a research that shows that it just irritates other people. You, you won't be loved because if a person loves themselves for, for no reason, it just other people not tend not to react in it. This is what would be called narcissistic. Um, but the idea is like catchy. Uh, we want to think that this is problem with our self-esteem that we feel boost, boosted, it, everything else will follow. It won't. So. Uh, according to Albert Bandura, he is a psychologist from Stanford University, and he claimed that ironically, it is talented people with high uh, aspirations who are especially prone to self-dissatisfaction, even if they uh, have some significant achievements. And we, we might claim that those people precisely have some significant achievements because they never it was never enough for them to believe in themselves, right? If you if you think that you are the greatest and the smartest one, why would you achieve something else? So the people with high achievements normally do have low, uh, low self-esteem because they're never satisfied with the results of, of their work. And they normally even have the um, inferiority complex, right? When they don't like themselves so much that no one who ever will uh, tell them that they are great, they won't believe it and they will try to improve their art or something else, which is also not perfect uh, state of existence, but at least it works and, uh, on the basis of it, one can have significant achievements. So there was a research to prove this uh, in 2007, uh, foresight, decided to disprove the idea that was common at the university that students need to have a high self-esteem in order to study better. The popular back then and still, uh, according to Alistair Smith, if you remember, the one who claimed the stress is the enemy of learning and you have to, the, the other enemy is low self-esteem. So they, they conducted experiment and they came to conclusion that uh, it's not true. A high self-esteem has nothing to do with a good uh, performance. So what they did in this experiment, they uh, separated students, low performing students uh, with low grades to uh, some groups. And one of the groups was getting, uh, was getting review questions and with addition to uh, something that will help them to uh, to heighten their self-esteem, like probably well done, uh, great work. And the other group of students uh, was just getting normal questions and, and was, uh, with some, uh, uh, something about responsibility and control additions. So at the end, those students who were getting those uh, emails with questions plus uh, uh, affirmations for 
bolstering their self-esteem started to uh, started to have even lower grades. So it worked in the opposite direction. And those students who were just getting questions with the emphasis on responsibility and control, they uh, nothing changed. And it's kind of logical because if someone try, if someone telling you that you are doing great when you're not doing great, why would you try to do uh, better? So it is natural that we want uh, to believe that if you start to believe that someone will tell you uh, good things and it will be good for us, uh, it's not uh, it's not true. It's just something that we want. Uh, we don't want to feel pain of other people criticizing us or ourselves criticizing us. But unfortunately, uh, like, <laughs> there is no other way to improve. It's better, of course, if, if it's not other person, but if it's you doing the work. Uh, and that's the only choice, right? Either you are criticizing you, this is how you improving yourself, or others criticizing you. It can be both. Um, the other research, basically similar, but it involved 802 students, uh, also proved that uh, the this goal that higher education uh, sets to uh, whatever uh, emphasis on self-esteem is overvalued and uh, doesn't help <laughs> it doesn't help to rise uh, academic achievements and uh, the strupinski and his colleagues he claimed what what is better prediction of uh, performance at university is not self-esteem it has nothing to do at all with uh, doesn't predict a high performance but uh, self-criticism rather and we we are not stupid we do try we you can, we can't trick ourselves just start to through for example some psychological methods uh, we can't think better about ourselves when we don't have achievements we do start to naturally think better about ourselves when we start to have achievements Otherwise, it just, the shortcut doesn't work. So students do tend to, first you, this, first you doubt yourself, then you, through this doubt, you improve yourself. Uh, then you have achievements, then you uh, naturally boost your self-esteem because you have reasons. So psychology might uh, offer you this idea that you, they might help you with your self-esteem and everything else will follow. But basically, we are not stupid to, believe it because the psychologist telling us or a book self-help book is telling us that we are great we would believe naturally uh, that we are great for for not long period of time <laughs> after we have some uh, some achievements but to get those achievements one needs to be critical of themselves and um, the other something um, angela lee duckward uh, she's psychologist and she claims that uh, in, uh, if we talk about success in learning or success at work, uh, one characteristic that emerged uh, uh, as a result of her research, uh, one characteristic that emerged as significant and was a good predictor of success, it wasn't uh, self the level of self-esteem, it also wasn't social, intelligence, uh, good looks or physical health, it, was, it wasn't IQ, it was great. Vydershka. <clears throat> Me might watch her TED talk uh, on YouTube, but mm, not uh, on, during the seminar. But also she's criticized and she probably should be because greed, uh, you can't, this is what popular psychology tends to do, and it has to be criticized for it. When, you, when it imposes uh, all the responsibility on personal success on a person, like try harder and you will get it, uh, excluding uh, social injustice and uh, lots of other cir circumstances um, of your possible success or the absence of success. But uh, anyway, read is more uh, reliable predictor of success than self-esteem. So there is no way around it. You have to, <laughs> you have to suffer. The only uh, way uh, 
the only choice is to how to suffer, what to suffer for, uh, how to distribute your suffering during your life, during your learning, uh, what to learn, uh, and how many hours per day maybe suffer, but not uh, the choice between non-suffering complete and suffering. And the other important thing maybe to talk is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, it was initially a hypothesis um, about, but not hypothesis, actually proved to some extent that uh, there is this cognitive bias that people with uh, low ability at task tend to overestimate uh, their ability and people and the opposite. People with high ability at task tend to underestimate their ability. So what they did, uh, they first asked uh, some psychology students, the group of psychology students to uh, predict their results on a test on a certain uh, subject. And after they actually run the test and it turned out the student who performed better in a test, they uh, underestimated their knowledge and the students who performed worse at the test, who had lower result at the test in a certain subject, they actually overestimated. So the less you know, the more you think you know. And the, the other way around, the, uh, the more you know, the more you doubt yourself. And there is this uh, thing. <laughs> so it shows that your confidence level, that if you know less, your confidence level is, uh, is high, tends to be high because you, uh, because you, don't, you don't even know that there is more to know, for example. So you feel more comfortable uh, and you feel that you already know a lot just because maybe you don't know that there is much more uh, to learn. Or, and once you start to discover that there is much more for you to learn. And once you start to accept, and this is a state of anxiety because you were perceiving yourself like uh, Jehovah Witnesses, right? They are, tend to think that they know everything and they would, the only thing they need to tell you is this knowledge. And they have uh, certain um, <coughs> books with pictures, there's enough space for pictures and a little bit space for, uh, for the information. And this information is about everything, right? In the small colorful book, they will present you information. So the next stage when you uh, have great confidence in knowing everything is to transmit the confidence. And interestingly, after their, uh, after their experiment, those students who had, uh, had low degree of uh, knowledge, but high self-esteem, they tended to say that uh, it wasn't fair, the test wasn't fair. So they were not admitting that they don't know enough. They tend to fight uh, the system and it's comfortable position. I do recommend it sincerely uh, to uh, not to doubt yourself, to think that you know everything. But when this jump down starts, you discover like Socrates, that you know nothing basically because there is so much more to, to learn on because someone knows better than you or because you get uh, got the low grade. This is traumatic. This is anxious uh, to, to recognize. And so you go to a valley of despair, but, and you might stay there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and in existential, from the existentialist perspective, that would be the score of existence. The anxiety, which is always there, you can always fall in there. Uh, but, and this mo moving uh, on the top, I would actually disagree with it. And from the perspective of existential uh, philosophy, it's only going down. There is no going up because it is going up when you start to be guru, going through the imposter syndrome, doubting your uh, qualities, uh, your qualification, but nonetheless learning more and more. This is how you actually uh, develop as a professional in certain, in certain uh, sphere of knowledge. But it's, you know, uh, 
there is always this chance that you, for example, will think, why am I learning it at all? Like, why? <laughs> or there is, uh, in every profession, it, it's not the stable state, state of, of something. It's always in a state of development. So basically, it's not this simple that you go down and then you happily go up. You basically go down. There is point to go down in the valley of despair uh, always. And the other thing that we are going to die. So no, no, matter, no matter how much knowledge we get, it's just pointless from this perspective that everything will die uh, with us. Uh, that's the good news. And that's the wisdom at the bottom, right? The other thing we have time to talk. So uh, small conclusion from this part is that stress uh, is not, it is, it might be, uh, something that we don't like to feel, especially when it's overwhelming, but a certain amount it will, will always be there. And good, uh, high level of self-esteem is not first thing that you need to think uh, when it comes to uh, learning. When it comes to learning, you need to think about learning, not about self-esteem. Uh, the, the other thing that we might have time to talk is... Uh, neurobiological concept of brain plasticity, uh, which is normally uh, as neurobiology in general is positively oriented, same as uh, psychology, especially common psychology, and meaning that our thinking uh, is escapist thinking, that's what we're playing. We tend to think of uh, processes, the main processes of positive processes as the main processes. And negative processes, we tend to think that they are not necessary and that they are, uh, well, we can get rid of them and it would be better, even better. So when we talk about brain plasticity, when neuroscientists would talk about brain plasticity, they would mention those positive processes as neurogenesis, neurogenesis, uh, uh, synaptogenesis, and long-term potentiation as the basic one that defines plasticity and plasticity of the brain, as you know, is something that uh, mm, embodies the, the process of learning, memorization, and thinking. Right? This is how it's represented on neurobiological uh, level, and we tend to uh, see them as uh, through those positive processes. We tend to see them as a central. Uh, you would discuss the generation, the appearance of new neurons, uh, the appearance of synapse uh, formation, and long-term potentiation, increase in synaptic strait. This is the famous HAPS uh, law, what fires together, wires together. And this is perceived the basic, the basic structure, the basic idea how thinking, how brain plasticity works. But we keep forgetting with this, our positively oriented perspective that for everything positive, there is also necessary negative side. And if we, for example, uh, except for neurogenesis, there is neuroapoptosis, is the program neuronal death, not only of neuronal uh, cells, but of other cells in our body, but uh, neurons are not uh, exception. So they not only they appear new neurons, they also die throughout our lives. And this is rarely mentioned. And if uh, when neuro and this weird uh, process of apoptosis, the self cell suicide was discovered, scientists thought that it's like weird and not important thing. But it turned out if you switch it off, nothing else will work. So this negative side in our body, and, uh, including in our brain, are important, and you can't just get rid of them. And everything else will not work too. They're as important as pro as positive ones. Synaptic pruning is same. Not only a new synapses connections between neurons are formed, but also they have to be eliminated. And most importantly, long-term depression of synapses. Not only so we tend to think of Hebb's law uh, as a main law that represents plasticity, but we keep forgetting that there is a long-term depression (LTD) weakening of synaptic connection and if we get rid we can't get rid of this process and keep only straightening it just won't work the negative one is also important just our thinking is structured in that way that we tend to see 
only good as necessary. And there is this great um, paper that even suggests that uh, although we tend to conceive uh, long-term potentiation as a key phenomenon, this Hab's law thingy, uh, the, the opposite perspective could also be true that it seems both of them are necessary and it's uh, up to us which one we take and see at the central and then just add another one. We can see long-term depression as the main um, as a main perspective. For me, here, what is important is that they also suggest that this perspective on evolution, that it's not only positive, like we tend to think phenomena, and if you get rid to negative phenomena extinction, it's going to be even better. It's not true. Both are, um, both are part of the same thing. Negative, destructive things are equally important. But here, they talk about learning. So they talk about learning from mistakes. They suggest the opposite perspective that recognize those negative um, negative sides, and they claim that uh, so long term depression might be seen and according according to them as a central phenomenon. Meaning, uh, uh, so environment works not as a teacher, as a kind teacher, but as a critic. You need to make a mistake and get negative feedback from reality, then get this. Um, long-term depression of synapses and this is how and this process is enough right it's only in the in comparison to this basic process that we can allocate long-term potentiation as a positive but it's not even necessary to to allocate it so it just it hurts you you do mistake and uh, you correct mistake and this is how uh, it works there is no other way uh, to learn except for learning from mistakes except first to make mistake get negative feedback suffer uh, emotionally and then correct the mistake and this is the process of learning it can be only positive there is no way to constitute it as only positive without suffering with just progress uh, without negative uh, negative sides to to it Okay, that's it. questions.